of coffee and a good vibe. We are in New York City with the legend Dan Churchill. Guys, if you don't know Dan Churchill, you will after this podcast, but you literally do it all. And once you hear his voice, you're going to die. They <laughs> just talk because he's Australian. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. <laughs> oh like, my God, that was so cliche. Uh, mate, welcome to my kitchen, my studio thank kitchen. You. Um, pleasure to have you. It was so cool to have you reach out. I think it was, was it, uh, it was Marcel who connected us, right? Yeah, Instagram. Shout out to Marcel. Yeah, he's Can on the style. podcast. I'll have his episode. Okay. Is that, uh, before mine? He's coming up because we already did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, okay, so you guys obviously know Marcel now. So, yes. Marcel connected us. We're now in my studio kitchen in New York City and I have the pleasure of holding a microphone like we're about to sing karaoke. Yeah, it's good vibes. Great vibes. Good vibes. Coffee and, good, and I just had a coffee. So it's good vibes and coffee. All of, like we love this because in New York, I know you're from Australia, mm. but in New York, you guys drink coffee. Mm. Like you guys are not afraid to have multiple coffees a day. 100%. What do you drink in LA? What's, what is it? It's, I drink coffee, but okay. a lot of people, we have matcha companies the matcha on this vibes. podcast. Matcha vibes. Matcha vibes. <laughs> matcha vibes, tea vibes. It should be like matcha kombucha, and a good vibe. All that stuff. Totally. Do you wear um question, serious question. Do you wear a brim hat after like 7 or 8 p.m.? No, I do not. Okay. <laughs> I walked into Soho House the other day and I saw people wearing it at the dinner table. I'm like, if that was me back in the day, my dad would have just smacked me across the face wearing a hat Which at the table. Soho House? Uh, it was me packing. Well, I was just there yesterday. <laughs> Damn it. We missed out on the half price I Monday together. Um, but yeah, now now apparently it's real trendy to wear a hat. Actually, hat looks really good. So I like I'm all about it. But anyway, it's a, it's a very much an LA vibe to me, seeing that oh. kind of stuff. So I put I put tea, matcha, kombucha, and also uh, It's so funny, like hat. what people think of people in LA. Yeah, good people. And then just chilled. Yeah. I like I like the East Coast vibe. But you're from Australia, from New York. Take us back. We're gonna go in on this journey, We're but detailed. give the people a little background on Dan. The journey, <sighs> you have so many endeavors, like yeah. this restaurant, Epic Table Podcast, Shameless Plug. Nice. You guys gotta listen to it. Thank you so much. Like you do all the things. Mm. So give us a little background on your journey to uh, where you are now. I should I, should I make it like a story arc? Yeah. Like, okay. Well, once upon a time, <laughs> there was a place called the Northern Beaches of Sydney, where a middle child from the Churchill Heart family. Uh, developed his understanding of living just an active lifestyle. Now, I, I was a, I always say this, like being in the middle of three boys, activity was never something that you had to worry about because you're always just running amok with each other, right? Um, but also just like being, being amongst the beach, the water, you always want to be outdoors apart mm. from like a period of just video gaming as young teenagers do. But ultimately, like I... I loved that side of things. I did not know completely what I wanted to do when I finished high school. And so I kind of thought about one thing I've always learned from mom and dad was, was do what you love. And so I kind of just took that and said, well, I love sport. Like I love, I want to play for my country in, in, in some sort of sport. So I went and did um, an educated, uh, I essentially went and did sport and exercise management as an undergraduate degree at the University of Technology, Sydney. And whilst I was doing that, I was learning all about, you know, the human body. I learned how to, you know, break down not just bones, but, you know, particular processes on the bones. I learned how we, we perform and move. Um, and I also learned a bit about business in, in that degree as well. But it was through that I was like, okay, well, my love, and this is like, I, I always kind of do a bit of a detailed analysis of this story because I think people can relate to the following your like passion kind of mm -hmm. thing. So I was in that moment going, okay, well, this is really cool. I've got a nice roundabout understanding of the human body and business, but I really want to know more about the human body. And that's even something today I was telling you, like I started my, my content creation when I was 21. And even to this day, I'm, I'm still looking up articles on human performance. So effectively from that, asked, I went and did a master's degree in exercise science. I was fortunate to get into, um, with my grades, to get into Edith Cowan University and do a, a, a two-year degree there. And so after that, I became a master's, um, you know, a postgraduate uh, individual with uh, this exercise science strength conditioning background. Wow. Throughout all this, though, I was cooking. I was <laughs> cooking at home. I was cooking for my brothers. I was cooking he for my mum. Oh. Where did that stem from? Well, see, this you is have the a thing. Chef parent? I don't have chef parents. Mum honestly did it because she had to look after three grown boys. Dad was a bit more adventurous with his cooking and still is this day. Like he's the kind of guy that 
would pull out a recipe out of a newspaper and stack it in a folder and I can just I can still picture the stack of folders of recipes right now that dad still has and he would he would you know change that up every now and then but I guess the the honest the honest truth is that when I was growing up my family the one thing we used to do as a family uh consistently was watch this program on on ABC in Australia and it was like this this guy called Jamie Oliver cooking mm. cooking like so passionately and you know using his hands and he's saying words like pucker and that's like wicked and like <laughs> you know all this British like things and anyway he just loved food yeah and I always saw chefs as these people that were like you know tall white hat kind of um big over overgrown like chef coat individuals and that yeah. was awesome but you never see these like rock star chefs and so when I was like around 15 16 where I could have left school and done that degree of just doing a going straight to culinary school yeah. the equivalent I I kind of looked into it and at the time the expectation of a chef when you're starting out is you peel broad beans for 90 hours a week which is fine if you want to be going the traditional route of like classic French cookery where it's kind of like a Mr. Miyagi thing of, <laughs> you know, you peel broad beans but you realise you're actually you know, realising something about yourself. And I was like, I'm, I'm too creative just to do yeah. that. So I didn't actually initially pursue chef world because of that. But after realising that, you know, I love my passion for human performance and how the body moves and how our gut works – but I loved cooking for my family. I loved it. I loved cooking mm. for my friends. My mates loved it. They were getting into it. And so when I was working with athletes um, through my master's degree, I got to work with teams as a strength conditioning coach. They also loved it. They loved to learn more about it. They didn't know what nutritionists were saying when they were telling them what to eat, but they knew what I was talking about with food. Mm -hmm. And they didn't realize it, but the food that I was helping them cook were the ones that the nutritionists wanted them to have. Mm. And so essentially then I just created a recipe book. That recipe book called was Dude Food. Dude Food sold really well, self-published that. Off the back of that, I did a second book. That sold really well. I started to do TV. I started to build a brand. And through consistency and doing all that, I, uh, yeah, like, okay, in a nutshell, to con combine that, like, initial launch phase, I went from being a strength conditioning coach by day to working in kitchens at nighttime because I had to be, I had to be chef trained to an extent. But I did it across, you know, eight to 12 different restaurants wow. over the course of that to truly understand different cuisines and cookery. And wow. so that was pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, eventually after enough, um, you know, profile, I got recognized in America. And so then oh, that's what we were just talking what about. That's I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. How did this all happen? America. How did we get to the US? And you that's were like, That's the question everyone else wants to know too. How did you do it? Well, I you can empathize with this, mate. Like So much. It was – it's – and I, I actually don't think I truly at the time recognize the difficulty in getting a visa to come to this country, the visa that we need, like you and I need to be entrepreneurs. Cause like you can come here and work for a company yep. and they can sponsor it. Um, and like, there's opportunities like that, but you're under someone else's wing and timeline and everything. hundred percent. And so like, and I'm know, sure you got dangled or there was even opportunities like that because you, you have all these accolades but for Dan, which one of my questions here, it's like your legacy, your purpose, you can't have that. You got to control the visa almost to like yeah, do whatever you want, have yeah. that freedom. It, it's, it's so tough. Like the visa you're on, like you've, you've managed to do it in a way that makes sense and allows you to do what you can do, right? Imagine yeah. um, there's another visa that only Australians actually have access to called the E3 visa. Yes. Have you heard about that one? Yes. Yeah, I it, know all the visas. Yeah, then you all, and then also like when you're in that journey, the universe just brings you people who are also in that journey. Yeah. So when I was in LA, I was meeting a lot of people going sure, through it. Sure. So you just educate yourself. You're pretty much, you're actually a, a, like a legal uh, counsel on, on immigration. You know what I need on the podcast? What's An that? affiliate deal you for need, visas. You need. I, I've just spoken to my immigration lawyer about two hours like, ago. Give me so a code, I'll, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> kind of swipe up link. Um, but no, it's like the E3 visa is a specific visa, not to get too dialed into this, but Australians are only the fortunate ones to get this. But if you get that, you have to work for only one company. So the oh, E3 visa only no allows way. you to work for one company. Forever, the whole visa? Just for the two-year visa you have it on, then you can reapply for it. But like that would be me saying, it's like, you know, our business, like it's you getting one account or one opportunity and then you cannot work with anyone else. And it's like, well, that's defeats the purpose of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was going for this visa, this O1 visa. 
and it's 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 actually for those listening in, it it sounds so douchey, but it's uh the brief, and you rock up rock up to your interview, and they go, "Why are you an alien of extraordinary ability?" ability. You just, and, yeah. and it's like, oh, okay, because the the two brothers on my shoulder are just giving like throwing things at me, just going, I "Can't believe you're saying that you're an alien of extraordinary." Like, firstly, you're an alien, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so you have this in the back of your mind, you're uh, already playing yourself down. But effectively, I had to provide all these contracts that I had coming over here. I had to mm-hmm. showcase that I had a TV deal, a book deal. Um, I had a place to live. I had media generating enough of my profile to say that I was a special alien. Um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, I remember I was, I was in Byron Bay shooting the final episode for a series. I was down there and my manager at the time rocked up to me. Um, and he walks up and big smile on his face and he goes, Dan, you got the visa. And I was like, that's huge. Wow. He's massive. And I, I must admit, like, yeah, it was kind of so naive of me to think that, like, it was a sure thing. And it wasn't a sure thing. Like, m- my manager works so hard to get to where it is. And then like, you think, like, you think you're just here, right? And you hear people in the stories of having to go back home as a result of visa issues. Mm-hmm. So I'm blessed to be in the position I am today. And I know, like, we, we, we worked hard. Like, we worked mm-hmm. so hard to prove it. But also we know that some people also work really hard and unfortunately don't get – um you know, don't get the same thing, but yeah. So effect- effectively all that allowed me to get to the U S got a book deal, got a TV deal, started out here in, I think it was 2016, I believe. Mm. I think, yeah, 2016. Um, so I've been here for a bit over five years now. I love that. That, and then we're going to get into that okay. too, which is everything cool. you're doing. Cause the visa you're on, you can do all the things. Yeah. You're like the you're extraordinary. You can do <laughs> so many things that you want to do. Thanks, but buddy. I gotta go into. I just want to go into that mindset area mm. there because one of the things I feel like personally, um, going through a visa journey, one of the constant questions that I got asked is like, because it's hard. Like if you actually go and like poke at it yep. on like the journey of it, um, like we can like paint the picture. But then when you start realizing, oh my god, I need to invest this much. Mm. I need to get this attorney. I need to do all this paperwork. It's a lot of work. And it's not if you want to, it's not for anyone who wants to maybe do it. It's like you're hundred percent all in. I'm doing it because it's that much work. Yeah. What was the mindset? I, I know it was like a couple, like five years ago, but mm. if you can go back to like the mindset in your head of like, cause you have to have that certainty in your head that, you know, you're going to go through all this and you, you have what it takes to get it. Cause that's what I, I had during my journey. It's like, I didn't let those voices come in my head, but like love family, loved ones, they would say like, but what if you don't get it? Mm. And I would just mute it. I'd be like, there's no such thing I'm getting. Like I was so confident cause I'm very big on affirming what you want and yeah, that ha- you only can speak positivity. Yeah. So can you go back to like, what was the mental framework? Yeah. I, I actually remember it. And yeah. I, I remember it because I think again, back to that naivety, I, the things that I'd done and was successful at, there was no, it was no question. Mm -hmm. Like creating your, like self-publishing a cookbook and selling thousands of copies. Like I didn't think I'd sent thousands and thousands, but like self-publishing a book, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And like, Mm -hmm. it's like you at that age, particularly, I was just like, I'm going to do this, going to learn if I make a mistake, sweet, whatever, but I'm just going to sell all the books that I've made. Right. Yeah. And the same principles kind of applied throughout everything that I've done. It's like, even here, I get here, didn't know anyone. I'm going to make a Mm -hmm. restaurant. Here we are in a restaurant. Inside the restaurant, I'll build a studio kitchen. We're in the studio kitchen. Yeah. I want to launch a podcast, Mm -hmm. launch a podcast. I'm the kind of person that like, if I really know I'm going to do something, I'm going to say it and do it. And so I know like there's a lot of things out of my control at the time, Mm -hmm. but I kind of always felt that there was going to be some way that I was going to get to America. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to, like watching all these movies, like Remember the Titans, yeah. you know, all these American Pie movies and like the college life and all these kind of things that yes. my brothers and I used to love. But, you know, I've always fascinated by truly impacting the world. And people say I have a very infectious uh, personality and mm-hmm. it's like it's, you know, it's drawn to. And, so, and, and it's just natural who I am. I'm excited by things that I really want to have an impact on. Like food is an unbelievable, you know, universal language. And so if, if I felt like I was at the time, my headspace was not doubt. If I was to answer your question, mm. there was no doubt. It wasn't a question. It was more of a, it was more of a case of how as opposed to, um, 
you know, what if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Where do you think that stemmed from? Good question. Did you have any, we're going to go, I know future, you have a lot of mm. more like routines, but that then, do you have any like mental frameworks, mentors, books, anything? Yeah, I had, I have, I have, I have one mentor and I still have him today. He, uh, his name's Dale Beaumont and Aussie and he's, uh, he's become a very good friend of mine. He's, he's someone who self-published books at a very young age too. And he was like telling me what to do. And, and you know, like I, you hear this so many times over. I'm just like a little exercise for everyone right now. Think of all the people in your life that truly are. Like say, maybe say pick three people in your life right now as you listen to this podcast that would have a profound impact on the way that you want to live your life. Not, not that like they influence you in a way that makes you do things, but like how that lift up your ability to do something. Mm. And there's a massive difference. And so like, I'm very stoked that people around me support my message as opposed to me following their message and then putting it into mine. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think the people I've always surrounded myself with um, are, are interesting people, but like my mentor is not someone who was, he did his own thing and then he just told me what I like, gave me advice and what to do. I actually remember it. I rocked into his mm -hmm. office and he, I'm like, how do I still publish a book? And he said, you need this, this, and this. And that's pretty much all he said. So I came back. I think it was five weeks later with everything. And he goes, oh, okay. So you're actually a, a doer yeah. like me. And it's kind of like a test. That was a Mr. Miyagi thing for sure. <laughs> and then, so I executed it. And it's just like, I think I've always had that keenness. If I'm really passionate, like I'm super passionate about things, I'm going to do it. Mm. Um, and so I've had mentors who have been those kind of people. My brothers are people that, you know, that haven't done anything in this world. They're like, you know, successful in their own right. But they're people that, help guide me and keep me narrow mm. and straight. And my, my family are the same people. And all my mates, like all my mates in New York city are, are down to earth people. And I truly believe that, you know, surrounding yourself with people who lift up your message, you know, or allow you to lift up your own message is key. I mm, really I'm so big on this. Mm. Like that's all I post about on the coffee and a good vibe. Instagram is like your environment is everything. The content you consume, the people you are around, because that determines your belief system, your 100%. reality, because that's like the, the scripts running in your head when you're listening to negativity. Yeah. And even if you're not like in that physical environment, it's like there's podcasts like the Epic Table, right? Like <laughs> you can put it in your ears, you can hear these like affirming words and wisdom and, and everything's like free. Like there's books, there's mentors that are there. I know there's like paid mentorship, but there's so many resources out there that I think like, I always say like, if you're listening to this, I commend you because it's like, you're taking that step. Mm. And it's almost like a domino, like your whole journey. Like you did the book, uh, you started like the session of the books and then it kind of dominoed into three books because yeah. you became so successful with it. And I feel like that's just like the big like ethos is what I'm like, here, like mission and around it. It's like, you just have to take the action and believe. And then it kind of your whole journey seems like it kept evolving. Yeah. Just believing and taking action. A hundred percent. Like if you're going to do something, like if you really want to do something, you'll do it. I'm a big believer in that. Mm. Like I, you hear people say they want to do something. There's want and actually do. And I'm not saying that everyone can just all of a sudden quit their job and, you know, do what they want to do right now. I'm not, I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm just saying there's like, if you want to learn a language, you say, I want to learn another language, go sign up and do it, you know? And it, it, there's so many things in this world where people continue to do the what if, what if, what if, as opposed to the do, do, do. Oh, I love that. Um, and yeah, it's just huge for me. And it's the same thing. Like essentially when I, I, I always know, and this is, I think this is the most fortunate thing I've had in my career, my profession, mm -hmm. in my life. I know what my North Star is. I knew at a young age what my North Star was. And so for me, if I ever started to slightly deviate I knew how to draw myself back in because it wasn't my North Star. I also knew that as new platforms came in, how was I going to take my message and just keep it on that platform in a way that's unique but still that North Star? Mm. And that's, that's a tough one because not everyone knows what they want to do all the time. Yeah. People say they want to be entrepreneurs but in what? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, totally. So that was always huge for me. Do you have a why, like one, like one mission statement of your why? Because I always say like, you, I know you're so passionate and there's mm. clearly like a big driver and ethos you're fulfilling for your life. Like what's Dan Churchill's like legacy statement or mission on this earth? Yeah, look, if, if we talked about this before, we actually, <laughs> as we're doing the, new web, the website now, we went through this yes. exercise 
But I think honestly, like the why, why do I do what I do is like, I get my, my, my currency, my why is when I get feedback from people on guests that I've had on the podcast about how that impacted them. I just had one of my closest friends, you know, reveal her story around her eating disorder. Mm. And so she's opened up and so many people have reached out saying, oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how much this made a difference to me. So it's like things like that. There's like cooking recipes and helping people truly understand the power of what bringing food, um, bringing people together through food is. I've had guys propose to their girlfriends over the recipes that I've helped them wow. create. So truly like my why is that food to me is far greater than the nutrition it provides. Wow. And I want to every single day work towards finding a way that um, I can have it used to really have a true happy happy impact on people's lives. Mm. I'm just I'm I'm blessed to be in the position I am, but that's my why. I love that. It's so powerful <laughs> and it's serving and scaling so abundantly. It's incredible. <laughs> um, going a little bit into uh, going back a little bit into the New York mm -hmm. journey and building that the brand that you have. I know people are probably wondering maybe two two things too. So you chose New York, yeah. big city. Huge Just city. like I chose LA, it's like big city, like big <laughs> cities of like sharks, you know, like mm. we're in a sh shark tank. We didn't choose like, I actually shouldn't name drop a state. I don't want to like, yeah. but like, it's just like, we didn't choose like a small, like nope. chilling state. You chose like the biggest city. Um, so what, like moving out here, not knowing a soul, how did you start building your network and your brand? And I know when you were in Aussie, you're huge. You're like the author, you're the successful young kid who's like done so many things. And then you moved to this city where no one knows who you are. So, and I know you, people like you and I, we thrive. I thrive in those kind of environments because it's a challenge and I sure. love it. Yeah. But like how someone listening is probably like, how did you do it? Yeah, look. Um, and you run with an amazing circle. You guys can even see like through your podcast, your network on social media. Yeah, you like, have an amazing group of friends. I I am just, uh, yeah. You know, I I definitely think we have a good we have a a good human policy. I, I really mean that. It's having friends and people in your life who are just good humans is mm. is not hard. But believe me, particularly in New York City, you can have a lot of people out there that want to use you for certain things and. I learned the hard way. I, I was 100% used in a lot of situations and didn't know it until experiencing it. So anytime like I have people come to this place and even like new people work at the restaurant and young people, I just kind of want to like make them know that you'll know who your true friends are and you have to almost unfortunately experience it firsthand to, to really recognize it. But I think for me it's like, again, going back to that, do what I love. What I love, I love coffee. So I'd, I'd be at Aussie cafe, shop, cafe shops and I love exercise and, you know, I'd, I'd eventually start getting these, these roles and opportunities to do certain things that would get me on, um, you know, either in uh, athletic environments or being able to hang out with people. And mm -hmm. so like-mindedness is, you can't, that's, it's, it's not something you can fake, right? If you're mm -hmm. not into something, but for example, there'd be times where people want to hang out just because you have an Instagram following, but it was really fake. Like you didn't actually have anything in common mm -hmm. and you do it to like, have a photo taken together and cross over each other's audiences. And really like over time, you probably lose the followers that they brought or vice versa based on the fact that you have nothing in common. And that's it's totally like fine. Genuine, yeah. yeah it's so like, it, it, that's where audiences, people listening in now, it's like everyone knows everything about you. And like, even with the podcast, it's like the guests I have on, I love them. Yeah, you know? like, <laughs> exactly. You want to champion them. Like I get people um, who reach out for the podcast and I'm just like, this is so not genuine. Like I you know. get an email pitch. Oh. I like choose everyone I put on, you yeah, know? Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm so humbled say. though. Any pitch I get, like I'm always humbled. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. But then I'm so, it's just the same you thing. Know. It's like, you want it to be so genuine. That, like It's like an hour in someone's ear. You want to, and you, you know, like you as a host, you know, when you have a connection and when you won't. And yeah. so you got to make sure that's because your audience knows that. But effectively, you know, I started just being active in terms of both physically and hanging out with people who are just, you know, who are actually either new from Australia or mm -hmm. who are Americans and were like-minded. Like I love, I love sport. I love everything activity. I love cooking. So two things that really aren't too much trouble to connect with people over. So yes. whether we're talking about NFL and, you know, watching sports somewhere at a bar, whatever it was, it was, uh, it wasn't too, being an Aussie in New York city, it's, it, you, for some reason we're likable, right? <laughs> so I'll take it. I'll absolutely take it. But 
Um, yeah, I think over time I just kind of made sure that once I learned my mistakes with true friends and realizing who they are, I just made sure that the people who are my true friends, I, I looked after them and they looked after me and vice versa. And your vibe attracts your tribe. I always say that. So like it just compounds. 100%. Once you meet like, especially for my LA journey, it's like once I met I went through the beginning of like the hard, what I'm really grateful for. It's like those relationships that didn't serve. I learned so much, yep. but then you meet good people and yep. then it compounds from there. 100%. Uh, I got to ask you, yeah. Dan's biggest tips for building personal brand, because Ooh. your brand is so, the thing I love about your brand and a lot of people listening, you got to check out your Instagram because it shows <laughs> like everything. But the thing I love about it is like, it's so multifaceted. Sure. Cause you're into cooking, but you're also super into the physical, the fitness, yep. nutrition, your personal life, your restaurant, um, the TV stuff, the books, like you have so many pillars, but that's the beauty of a personal brand. It's like, you can be multifaceted. So yeah. how best tips for like scaling a personal brand? So scaling it, to, uh, firstly building, everyone has a personal brand, whether yeah. it's prolific, like in the sense that you're a profile or you not, like if you go in for an interview and it's for any job, you still have a personal brand. So this applies to everybody. I think uh, if you are trying to scale your personal brand, just be aware it's it, it takes a lot of consistency and long hard work. And we'll get into some tips in a second, but just know it's dedication and you're with you, you're with you for the rest of your life. Mm. So do it for the rest of your life. Go for the for the hard yards. So here's what I would say. First and foremost. If people to come to any page or meet you, what what are you doing to support them? What's the like, oh, I'm going to hang out with Dan. Or I'm going to see Dan on his website. What is Dan doing for me? Because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. interested to follow him. So, for example, my thing is I help people find the right foods that help them perform optimally. And so then every facet that I do around media is a way of creating awareness for them, right? So everything I do is like essentially I'm, I'm a chef and I'm all about creating recipes and content and, um, you know, studies, like cl uh, clinic, uh, clinical studies that help people understand what's right for them, all right? So then you've got the podcast, the TV, the Instagram, all that kind of stuff that helps send that message. But how do you do this from the start? So pick one thing, all right, that you truly want people to, you know, know you for. As I said before, <laughs> it was about me all about helping people find the right foods to help them move, perform, be happy, optimally, all that kind of stuff. So again, you've got platforms for that to go on. You've got a website, TV, Instagram, social media platforms, podcast. But that's my one thing. The biggest thing though is number one, put out content. Number two, be consistent with your content. Three, optimize your content through SEO and rinse and repeat. And then also mm. the fourth one is, you, is learn to adapt. Yes, that's so... You know, yeah. so like Instagram was not the same 10 years ago and it's, or even nine years ago when it was, it was only one image. You can only put one image on. Now you've got carousel, <laughs> you've got you know, IGTV, reels. you've got real stories, like learn to adapt and continue to talk to your audience. So again, put up content, do it, be consistent with it, optimize your content, adapt. And I'd also say analyze and respond because... Ultimately, between those five things, if you're not actually even analyzing your content to mm -hmm. know what's working, then you won't, uh, you know, you, you may not, you may be surprised what works and what doesn't. Yeah, because you're getting all this feedback from your audience yeah. and you can like keep creating different things that are going to further serve. Tip one, right? Like <laughs> Tip one. giving them the value. And then even with advancing like your new website that at this time, guys, the link is in the show notes. Love it's launched it. and you have like a course, right? It's like someone might be like, oh, I want to launch a course, but you've been nurturing your audience for years yeah. and putting out all this content that now you're going to have a course that's going to meet and serve these needs and desires of people. And it's like, you know, this course is going to sell because you've been rinsing and repeating for so long, 100%, right? 100%. I love that. Um, shifting gears into the food. Okay? Nice. Let's, Let's go into food. So Charlie Street, mm. how did that come about? The concept, <laughs> explain it. Um, I am obsessed. I, I'm so excited. I'm here for another week. I'm going to be coming here and posting <laughs> up. When I got here, people are like working. It's such a good vibe. It's a great vibe. So tell us about Charlie Street. Also, um, where location. So people listening when they yeah. come to New York. So we are uh, specifically 41 Canmare Street. Uh, we're in a place called Nolita. It's a suburb like all parts of uh, New York City. It has got a great little purpose behind it. So Nolita stands for North of Little Italy. Oh. All right. 
You know what Soho stands for? Yeah, what's Soho? Soho, uh, south of Houston. Oh. And you got NoHo, which is north of Houston. You know what Tribeca stands for? Triangle beneath Canal. This is like a New York crash yeah, course yeah, 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 100%. right now. I'll, I'll fully open up for you. Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Wow. Yeah. So you got all these little acronyms and things that stand for. Wow, I love that. So anyway, the, uh, the, the, the restaurant of Charlie Street, Aussie Cafe slash restaurant, we, we opened up 2018 and it was pretty much – it initially started as people asking me, Dan, where can I eat your food that you keep putting about? Because they don't want to cook it, right? They're like, <laughs> they keep seeing all these recipes and like, Dan, I want to eat the food you keep talking about. And uh, so I'm like, sweet. So I clearly got to do a restaurant. So within a space of like a year and a half of that, which yeah. is relatively quick to do, you know, raise money, build a team, find a location, build out the space, get that team going, get it up and running. We had a restaurant called Charlie Street. Wow. And it is like anything adapted and evolved over time. So what it is today is definitely not what it wasn't, uh, you know, when we first opened. And obviously COVID was a massive eye-opening experience for the team. Um, so, yeah, we've had to truly adapt like every restaurant has mm. always, irrespective of COVID. But, uh, yeah, now you can – now you see firsthand for yourself. We've got a pretty awesome community of people upstairs. Yeah. And it's great vibes. Yeah, you attract in all the best energy mm. with Charlie Street. Like, mm. what's the mission vision? Any like business plans to keep innovating? With yeah, hundred percent. So, like, we initially started as like a best way to put it, and the best way I think people, particularly from America, can understand is we started as like the Australian version of Sweet Green. So, finding ways to be more of a no breakfast way. breakfast crowd, breakfast and lunch. People love breakfast all yeah, the whole exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. So that was our initial thing, right? We love what the guys at Sweet Green have done. Um, I'm actually friends with one of the, the, the founders and he was like just – seeing what they've done was super impressive. Mm -hmm. However, as you learn to adapt, you see that there's other ways you can have a true impact. And so we still want to scale maybe definitely not that much, but we want to be doing – we're going to be releasing a product very shortly. Actually, it's – going to be out right now yeah sweet yeah yeah so it's going to be out and this product if you haven't already seen it is called charlie street's bolognese and charlie mm. street's chorizo now these two products proud to say it are made entirely out of whole food plants so like they're not they're not synthetically created they're not going through any huge processes like some of the other competitors so our point of difference is actually good for the environment and good for you, not just good for the environment. I love that. Um, and so everything that we do at Charlie Street's always been around, you know, firstly providing a pretty cool Aussie cafe experience like people love. Yeah, I love that. But second to it is we want to have people eat more plants and they don't have to be plant-based. But I'm sure everyone listening here is, you know, you're a very healthy, young, aspiring individual. And so people see that, Plants are good for you and they find, want to find a tasty way to do it. And yeah. it's not that they don't want to do it, irrespective of eating um, meat or not. They just want to eat more plants. So these yeah. products are simply there to help people eat more plants. That's what we want to do. That's amazing. I love that. That's mm. so inspiring too because um, anyone like looking at you and like the lifestyle you live, I feel like with fitness, a lot of people, including myself, I used to do fitness competitions like grow up 17 to 21. And nice. it's like I was on just like, chicken and Broccoli. and fish and like meat red meat even because like for lifting weights and just like the protein the macros like yeah. it changed my whole mindset with food yes there was like so many benefits of like learning about macros and everything at a young age but then also viewing food as like i have such a different relationship from that age like viewing food like that for years and now it's like viewing it from this angle. I think it's so important and it's so nice to see people in the fitness space because we're getting that. I want to hear your routines, <laughs> but like how active you are and sure. like how you fuel yourself. Because someone watching is like, I want to look like Dan and Dan eats plants too. Yeah. Versus like this other mindset of like, you have to eat chicken and broccoli all day long to look like that. Yeah. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm a chef and so. Food's always never been about, and particularly like the Italian roots for me and my family, it's always been about the the benefit of that. I remember saying before, it's like irrespective of the nutritional benefits, it should always be around the happiness it brings you. Mm. I had a podcast with uh, a couple of people actually, one with a guy called Nick Bear, and I was talking to him about this and we're talking about the importance of why you shouldn't count calories and you should base it around, you know, um, your athletic performance. So essentially eat for performance and not aesthetics. 
There's a there's an IGTV Ooh, on my Instagram. That. Yeah, if you, so could, good. if you check out my Instagram, there's an IGTV on. We talk about that. So, and it was a great podcast because we, we like how much people's perspective on life changed once they started to eat for performance and not aesthetics was dramatic. Because you don't only just get the nutritional benefits, you also get the wonderful benefits around your hormones. And I think that was something that people realized when they're putting so much pressure, like for yourself, like when you're doing macros, you are stressed. counting stress. Stressed, you like mean. I need to get to the Pacific gram. I'm and you're hungry, like, but I have to eat this meal. Yeah, or vice versa. Exactly. I'm starving and I have no macros. That's a terrible way to think about food. Uh, and so we just simply change that. We want to make sure people eat for performance where it's like, if you feel mm-hmm. like you really need it. And, and that's part of what my course is about is helping people truly understand what works for them. Yeah, I love that. That's so needed in this world. I'm excited for that. Um, do you have any like ethos around or like principles or food? I know it's like rules, but like a way of life that you, I think you kind of like went on it, but you know how like some people are like, I know this is not you, keto only or yeah. only eat plants yeah, 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 or yeah. paleo. Do you have any of those or no. like intermittent fasting or like anything that you like stick to? Yeah, like, okay, so he's-, he's Oh, I know he also, I've learned already from you. It's personal. It's not there always the same right? I've already learned this, yes, soaked it up from you. you. So you've been doing your research. <laughs> but effectively, fact number one is there's this term called bio-individuality, all right? So bio-individuality is for you to look at yourself as an individual that is- truly unique Mm -hmm. right no one else is like you now one you have your dna and even if you're a twin you actually have the same dna specifically to like you know identical twins but as we've learned through all the gut health stuff we've been listening to if you have your gut microbiome against your dna you are so different absolutely so different and so that's why you as an individual cannot Pertain yourself to be directed at one particular meal type, setting, keto, everything like this. You have to work out what's right for you. So um, on one end, like you can do that through just subjective means. Like you can do everything from assessing how you feel, how you felt Mm -hmm. after a meal, how you feel after a day. Are you going to the bathroom regularly? Are you not? Is it consistent? We talked about this a lot um, with an Australian uh, gut health expert actually in in the UK. Um, And so – that, those are very subjective means, which is awesome. You can do other things like there's a, uh, a work with this company called Zoe and Zoe is like a gut health testing kit. So cool. So it tests your gut. It We're tests, all about gut health on yes. this podcast. Yes. If you want to like know in specifics, you essentially go to Zoe and you go, you've got your gut health tests and then you do your blood work and they also do your glucose and they are able to assess three biomarkers and spit out like this information telling you what you're deficient in. Wow. So it's pretty amazing. And then, then I provide you the recipes effectively what's right wow. for you. But yeah, so- my philosophy around food, firstly, number one, bio-individuality. Look at yourself as an individual. Just because it works for me doesn't mean the same thing's going to work for you. Number two, everyone's going to be irrespective, I guarantee it, needing to eat more plants. It doesn't matter if you eat red meat, chicken, fish, or you're plant-based. People forget that plants are the biggest deficiency that we have in particularly diversity, the amount of plants we are having. So that's my mm. thing is like to eat more color. It's the best way to do it. So at the end of the week, have a think about how many different colors you consume during the week. If you need to increase your reds, greens, oranges, whatever it is, go for it. And then number three, protein. Now, there's such a subjective way of looking at this. My philosophy on protein is should you eat, firstly, the type of protein. This is getting into a bit nitty gritty, so I don't know how, how I'll try to like make it simple, but the biggest issue people find about um, eating plants only is that they feel they're not going to get enough to support their muscle growth and they're going to get smaller if you need to see a plant-based individual who is shredded big to set the tone there's a guy called simon hill from plant proof big dude ripped one of my mates one of my friends is like that too ripped in plant-based yeah it's crazy and it's essentially more around like the the amount or the type of amino acid profile because you've got incomplete you've got complete proteins and that's a really bad, I guess, um, way of grouping them because incomplete doesn't mean bad. It just means it doesn't have all the amino yeah, acids, totally. right? You can have a lot of the existing amount of amino acids in incomplete. So like, you know, it just won't have all of them. But effectively my rule is workout works for you. Mm-hmm. Eat more color. And then when it comes to protein, you know, choose again what works for you, but don't feel like you can't eat plants to sufficiently get what, right, what uh, enough protein into your week and day. 
I love that. You're all with the tips. You got all the value. I love it. <laughs> I, like, I, I, I got even my favorite part of like the podcast is when I can ask this. And especially for you, it's like I'm really excited to go sure. down on this because you're a podcast host. So sure. the biggest blessing I feel like with being a podcast host is selfishly we're so act, we're, we become better listeners. So we're like yeah. active listeners. But you get to soak up all the knowledge like so many times because editing and like real time. So you probably are given all these like tools in your toolkit, but like, what is Dan's routine non-negotiable? I feel, I know you have like a sh good morning routine. Mm. Um, could you share your morning routine? Yeah, of course. Like it's actually, it continues to change based on like, I have a puppy now, Maverick. Aww. He's a little legend, but Maverick Lovely. now needs to get walked in the morning, which is totally fine. It just means that my typical routine of getting up early and reading my book, uh, no longer exists because when I get up in the morning, all he wants to do is like bro down and like, you know. What uh, time is that too? Uh, around six, bit before six, like 5.30, six o'clock. And so like he, 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 I'll get out of bed, I'll, I'll get out into the living room and the guy's like, I, I call him the wiggle butt because he got like his, wig, his butt like wiggles when he wags his tail and it's like he wiggles it back and forward yeah. and it's really awesome. Anyway, so he jumps off on the couch from sitting there with my coffee and I'm just like, I'm trying to read his book and he's just tapping me. He scrapes me. Move. Yeah, he, he's like, bro, come on, I want to I hang. So I'm like, fuck, all right, sweet. So now what I do is I take Matt for a walk early, but I listen to audiobooks. Love that. So I take him for a walk, we hang out, um, he gets his bro time in. How long? We like details. Oh, sweet, yeah. So like say six, depending. If I've got – I'm training for half Ironman right now and also the marathon. Wow. So – um, I'd say take him out of bed at quarter to six, go by like 6.45, I'm done. And the gym's pretty close. So either hit the gym, I'm probably in the gym specifically two to three times a week doing just resistance training. Mm -hmm. But um, other days I try to be on the bike or running by seven at the latest. If I'm doing the swim, the swim's easy because I can do – an hour of uh, like 40 minutes of that. And I'm absolutely happy with that. It's more or less, I have to be at work at the latest by 8.30. So mm -hmm. I guess to sizzle all together, but before 8.30, I've walked Mav for a, a solid 45. I've listened to a book um, at the same time. I have had my coffee, which is really important. And then I've gone to the gym or I've done sort of exercise outside. Uh, and then I've come home, showered, and I'm at work on the like eight eight thirty is a non non negotiable. Mm, I love that. And do you do the workout fasted? Yeah. So typically I do. Uh, it depends. Like again, listen to my body every. So with my Epic Table community on my podcast, every first Monday to Friday of the month we fast. So we do a sixteen hour fast, eight hour eating window. So the first Monday to Friday every month. So for example, we had the July fast. Wow. We have the the, uh, the and it's August like a reset. Fast. Yeah, it's a reset. It's like a great way as a community to do it all together. And you know, I typically do black coffee beforehand if. I know I'm about to go for a big, long, like two hour effort on a bike and a swim and a run. I definitely have like a banana or, you know, or something beforehand, yeah. but it all also depends. Like I may have woken up really hungry based on a huge workout the day before. And, and I'm not, if I'm not fasting, I go, my body needs food. So I'm like, sweet, I'm going to go smash an oatmeal or something like that. So again, mm. I don't, I don't, I think the biggest philosophy I live by is listening to my body. Like I listen to my gut. I really mm. do. And my gut tells me so much about things. Like if I wake up in the morning and, you know, I'm really hungry. I'm like, guess what? I'm going to feed it because I know the yeah. day that I have, like when I just work, if I'm chefing at the restaurant, I burn so many calories and I lose so much weight. Yeah, because <laughs> so, you're active all day active long. Active all day. And then you work out and you don't realize like, well, I've done like six and a half thousand, seven wow. thousand calories today. I love that. And I love that you, you, you say this a lot and you enforce it because there's so many people online who are in the – fitness health space, yeah. uh, nutrition space, and they they preach their diet as 100%. like the way and then people do it and maybe they don't have the same success and then yeah. they lose motivation to even try it or like to stay on track or like they think like, oh, I can never achieve the body composition of my dreams because that diet didn't work but it's like you're that's why i love what you're preaching and how so i know people are gonna have to like figure out the like join your course yeah, so they sure. can like understand how they can strengthen that yep. that intuition mm -hmm. um but any like tips for anyone who's looking to start their journey of like not even just looking their best feeling their best because that's going to determine everything right how you feel is going to determine how you show up to the day yeah 100 percent. i think look 
you and I can tell people to go do certain habits and routines, yeah. but it's not going to matter until within themselves, they truly want to get it going, totally. you know, like ultimately you want like some sort of intrinsic motivation to get you going. You want to be truly, you know, inspired from within to go do something. Yeah. And what, what's so interesting for me is like, I can tell you that you can figure it out yourself and you have all these courses and opportunities to do that. But first and foremost, find out what really lights you up. Mm. What inspires you to really make, is it your kids? Is it the fact that you always wanted to run a certain marathon or is it that you just want to be less tired? Like what is it? And, and figure out that why then follow some people that you're inspired by who have credible information, not just like information they've just posted about, like credible information that's been, you know, clinically sourced. Uh, and I think that's so key because uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, unfortunately. Yeah, but then they have the pleasure of hearing this and they have like the right resources to go to. And I just want to thank you and honor you so much for your time and all the value you shared. I know the audience is so grateful and I would love for you to plug away. Like <laughs> we'll have it all in the show notes, um, but plug it all. Where's the best place to find you? Where are you most active? I know we heard the tips. Yeah. Right? So give us those. Okay, so... Best place to find me is Instagram. So Dan underscore Churchill. You see my head uh, in chef whites and smiling like a yeah like a kid, which is great. Uh, so there's uh, Instagram, and then you've got my website, which is where you find all the information on courses. Dan the new website dot com. That's it. Uh, if you want to listen to a podcast that is all the stuff we've kind of been at a foundation that we've been talking about today, it's called The Epic Table. You can put in Spotify or podcasts um, on Apple, or every, wherever you listen to your podcasts, just go Dan Churchill. Uh, you'll also find it on there. So hit subscribe. And uh, of course, make sure you leave a review on this podcast as well. Because it, it works. Like five-star review and, and write a comment too, because we love that, right? Love it. Love it always. <laughs> Thank you guys. Help me do this always. call to actions always. on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, and man. guys, thank you so much for listening. We will see you in the next one. Oh, 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 oh,